Welcome back to another episode of FPOG, Financial Planning for Oil and Gas Professionals. This week on the podcast, I'm excited to welcome a guest. We have Matt Sands with Silver Heels Investments to talk with us about mineral rights. We're going to talk about the basics, constructing a team. We're going to talk about financial planning considerations, mistakes he's seen, and also more about him and his expertise. Matt, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Jared. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I am as well. I am as well. Um, I, I feel like a good place to start would be, I, I would love to just introduce the listeners to you. Um, so I'm just going to, we prepared a little uh, description uh, of you and your career experience, but you could fill in where I'm missing the gaps. So Matt, we're excited to have you on the podcast today because you know, you're an engineer by trade. You got almost 25 years of experience. Um, you worked for Shell Exploration and Production Company. But now you're doing Silver Heels. Uh, and so that's essentially consulting for mineral rights and kind of royalty interests. How long have you been uh, doing your own thing with Silver Heels? Well, I've been doing my own thing with Silver Heels now for, I guess, uh, going on almost eight years. So, uh, like you said, uh, you know, we used to work in the oil and gas industry on the operator side, uh, started my career with Shell and, and left in 2015 sort of at that uh, time when there was a downturn, uh, you know, had to make a personal decision. We had the opportunity to move back to Houston. Um, you know, growing up, I'm from Colorado originally, so is my wife. We have family here. and We wanted to raise kids here. So I had to make the decision to either relocate to Houston or to leave the company at that time. And so we decided to go off and, uh, you know, stay here. And so I decided at that time might be a good time to change uh, my career path. And, you know, pursue a, a passion of mine. And I, I love the oil and gas industry. I wanted to stay in the oil and gas industry, but I wanted to have more control over the direction that my career headed. So I decided to start my uh, investing business initially uh, with Silver Heels Investments. And the initial focus was really investing in minerals and royalties and trying to leverage some of my industry experience to uh, to invest in that asset class. And then that sort of mor morphed over time into sort of say half investing uh, my personal, uh, you know, assets into minerals and royalties, as well as helping other investors and then helping other individual mineral owners and families just navigate the complex area around oil and gas and minerals and royalties. Awesome. Awesome. I've noticed, you know, with a lot of our clients who are leaving super majors, a lot of them will do some form of like consulting, have a very specialized form of experience. And they'll, you know, parlay that into consulting gigs with a few roles or kind of do that on their own terms. I didn't realize that Silver Heels was initially, you know, investment focused because now it seems like a lot of the, you know, a lot of the podcast content, which we haven't even talked about that. Matt is also the host of the Mineral Rights Podcast, which is how I came to how we came to find him, which is a great resource for anybody wanting to do, uh, you know, deep dive, learn all the nuance and the planning complexity that is mineral rights and royalty interests. He's, I think, over two hundred episodes in, so a awesome, awesome resource for anybody uh, looking to do that. And Matt, you're also the uh, Rocky Mountain chapter president of NARO, uh, National Association of Royalty Owners. So you do like a little bit of you know advocacy work, uh, advocacy work as well. Matt, I'm really excited to have you because, you know, as you can see, very credentialed experience, uh, a lot of value you can add to our our listeners. Um, but I, I feel like a good place just kind of in framing this conversation is, you know, our audience is going to be a wide range of listeners, right? We have people retiring from super majors that have no mineral or royalty interests. We probably have a few families, you know, that are native Texans that probably get a K-1 or some royalty interest that they have that they know nothing about. And then we, you know, we probably have a few listeners that are families with substantial mineral assets, right? So really, this is, you know, we have we have an audience coming from a bunch of different places. So, you know, we're going to cover a lot of ground today, uh, probably kind of broad stroke, but we'll probably have to have you on uh, next go around another time to, to kind of go a level deeper. Sounds good. Okay, Matt, so um, I would love for you, I, I feel like before we get into kind of the curriculum of, hey, here's the few things we want to talk about. Um, I'd love for you to just tell us about, like, just go a step deeper. So Silver Heels is, okay, you do investing, and then you also do consulting. Like, what what, it, what does consulting and mineral, mineral rights look like? What is, the, what is the type of work you're doing? Uh, what families or businesses are you kind of do? Who do you do your best work for? You know, what, what are you doing to, to help these families kind of manage the complexity that is mineral royalties? That's a good question. So 
that is, uh, you know, I guess my role is sort of a jack of all trades. Uh, my main area that I get a lot of questions and a lot of work is around uh, valuations and appraisals. So just helping people understand what these assets are worth. And for uh, those of your listeners who are reservoir engineers, they'll be very familiar with this type of work. And, and it's something that, um, you know, I'm not a reservoir engineer, but, uh, you know, have sort of taken that training, you know, on the job training and learning how to, to do reservoir engineering and to do, uh, you know, reserves estimates and valuations of mineral and royalty assets in these unconventional basins. And, and really, it's just understanding you know, discounted cash flow analysis, what is the future potential and, and current potential of these assets in today's dollars to help owners make an informed decision. You know, a lot of times they're approached to sell these types of interests and really don't know what they're worth. They get a very compelling offer, uh, you know, unsolicited offer in the mail and, and they want to know, is this, you know, what this thing is worth? I want to really dig a little bit deeper. And so those that want to spend a little bit of time and, and understand you know, what that uh, potential asset is worth before they make the decision to sell. That's something that I, you know, obviously, before you make a, an important financial decision like that, you want to have all the information. And so that's sort of my role is helping those people understand what the asset's worth. And then on the other side, so, th- so my consulting, like you mentioned earlier, is both for uh, individual investors, small investors, that don't have the expertise or uh, in-house uh, engineering staff that run economics and do those kinds of things. So I can fill that role for folks, uh, you know, and the investment side of things as well. So it's not just I own, my family owns minerals and we were thinking about selling. We want to know what they're worth, or maybe we did sell. We want to know if we can establish a step up in cost basis to save on capital gains taxes, those types of things. It's, it's really helping uh, the people that want to get in st- started investing, you know, that's kind of been a big portion of my uh, business in the past year or so is helping, um, you know, high net worth, uh, you know, accredited investors who are looking at investing in this asset ca- class directly, helping them navigate the process and understand how to make uh, sense of these types of assets so that they can invest in them. You know, a lot of those folks sometimes don't have oil and gas background as well. So. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, then it's, you know, kind of everything in between, you know, not just the valuation side. It's somebody gets a division order, wants to know, is this decimal interest in this well correct? It's sort of, I broadly call it just sort of mineral management services, but we don't uh, manage minerals like a traditional like bank trust department or mineral management department where they're depositing checks and distributing uh, you know, income to the uh, the family members and stuff like that. It's more just you know, advisory services and questions, Hey, you know, I I need to have somebody to go to, to get an answer, uh, you know, to understand what I need to be doing here. And that's sort of what we fill that role. Got it. So more strategic, higher level versus the implementation of making sure that, you know, this wells reporting the correct income and the depletion is being appropriately counted for on this and the checks are being deposited in the appropriate entities kind of things like that. So more strategic, uh, uh, which is great. Matt, you touched on something that I want to go a level deeper on. You talked about a big part of what you help with is valuation, right? And you have actually have a podcast on this, which we'll include a link to in the show notes. But, you know, there's different ways you can come at evaluation, right? You can look at comps. So, okay, what is for a comparable sales in my area, in the, in the you know, in the basin I'm in, what, what, what do comps look like, right? You could also say, hey, net present value of, of cash flows, which may be a little more difficult to, uh, maybe a little more difficult to evaluate because there may be active and inactri- inactive interest that could become active, right? And then there's also like third-party valuation services, like someone like like you. So I'd love for you to just touch on generally what's the what's the best way to do it? Because my guess is it's kind of like a house where if you get an unsolicited offer in the mail, it's probably going to be a low ball because these people just send out a massive quantity of you know massive quantity and just hope somebody will take the bait and kind of you know, leave money on the table for the convenience of just, you know, not having to not having to figure out what the asset is worth or sell it themselves. So I'd love for you to just talk about, you know, how you think about valuation and, and you know, which methodology, there's probably not a, a, a this is always right, but in, in general, which one do you lean on and which one kind of makes sense? Yeah. And I think, you know, thinking about value, you know, the IRS has a, a definition of fair market value and it's, you know, the price at which an uh, asset will change hands in an arm's length transaction. And 
you know, you mentioned comps and unfortunately with minerals and royalties, there isn't a service or a website like Zillow that you can go to, to see, you know, what are the other mineral assets, uh, exchanging hands for in my area. You have to go and pull records from the, the county. Now, Oklahoma is one state that you can sometimes glean that information because they have a documentary stamp fee, or in other words, the fee that is required to, to be paid when you record a deed. And that is based on the sales price, even for mineral assets. Now, the rest of the states generally don't uh, require that. So you can't determine what was actually paid. You know, it'll say something on the deed like for $10 and other good and valuable consideration. And so it's, you can't really know how much uh, the buyer actually paid the seller. And so pulling comps is, is somewhat problematic and you can't get a really uh, broad data set for an area and or maybe there's not a lot of um, assets uh, changing hands in a particular area. And, you know, maybe it's not really that hot or, you know, whatever. So you have to think of other ways to figure out what these assets are worth. And that's where, like you mentioned, doing NPV of cash flow. So discounted cash flow analysis where you're looking at, you know, if there's producing wells, you're doing decline curve analysis to figure out uh, what those wells are going to produce in the future. And if, you know, there's some undeveloped acreage and some upside potential, you look at what the type curves are in that area and what a future well might do. And then you add that all together over time, you know, determining what commodity prices are going to do. You know, your best guess at that is, you know, sometimes anybody's guess, but, uh, you know, and then timing of, of wind wells are drilled, of course, is one of the biggest levers on value. And so you have to figure all of that out, you know, read the tea leaves, looking at, you know, company investor presentations and figuring out what the a- operator is likely to do in that area and when a well could get drilled. And that altogether, um, generally that cash flow analysis is usually the primary method that we use to determine value just because you can make an educated guess on development timing, on commodity prices and, and well performance and things like that. Um, whereas again, sometimes with comps, you really just are, are making a guess unless you actually go and contact the seller and, and ask them, you know, Hey, how much did you sell this for? And was there anything else besides you know, that compensation that was, was provided when you sold that? Cause that's the other thing you really can't figure out from just looking at a deed is, you know, was there a relationship between the buyer and seller? Was that truly an arm's length transaction? So there's some complications around using that, uh, the comps method, uh, so that's that's generally how we look at it. Those is, is discounted cash flow. Yeah, and I love your statement on you know it's it's our best guess, right? Because like valuation work, especially right when there's you know non-producing minerals and producing minerals, and you know you're extrapolating decades into the future, trying to also manage. Okay, what do I think development's going to look like? What's you know what's the expenditure curve, and what do I think future you know prices are going to be at. So it, it is, and, and what, what discount rate am I going to use? It's all kind of a function of an estimate, educated guess, but, but it sounds like, you know, coming up with an MPV is the most, you know, a, a defensible way is a good starting point for valuation. So when you get these, you know, unsolicited offers from just kind of somebody, you know, we had a prospect reach out to us the other day and say, Hey, I got an offer for somebody to buy my minerals. What's typically the catalyst? Is there a catalyst for someone to for, for a company to reach out and just begin kind of acquiring minerals in a, in a certain asset or, uh, you know, what, what generally causes somebody to, or, or, or are, are there companies that just do that on an ongoing basis? What, what typically uh, inclines a company to do that? There are some companies that may do that on an ongoing basis. So there may not be a, a triggering event, but I'd say in general, most mineral buyers are looking to what they call buy ahead of the drill bit. In other words, where there are new uh, well permits that have been filed, where a rig is on site drilling, or maybe wells have been drilled and are going to be completed soon. And so they're looking for um, de-risking that asset to your earlier point about the uncertainty and the risk associated with these types of investments is they can de-risk the timing element if they know that uh, the company has already invested capital in that area you know, by drilling a well, whether it's surface casing or the full well bore, um, you can get uh, a good indication that that company is committed then to eventually complete those wells and then there'll be a royalty income stream coming in. And so uh, investors will look at that as really the the main um, triggering event to go and, and contact mineral and royalty owners in uh, those wells that have been permitted and then make an offer because they know that that timing element has been de-risked to a certain extent 
And then, you know, nowadays with the, the shale revolution well underway, we're, you know, a good 10 years in, uh, you know, they can have a pretty good idea what the well performance is going to be like in, in an area. And especially if they're buying in a core part of these uh, shale basins, they can uh, pretty accurately forecast what a new well uh, is going to do in terms of uh, future production rates, oil and gas, uh, and natural gas liquids, and those kinds of things. So that's, I guess, really the the one thing that uh, investors will do is they want to make a, a return on the investment in a reasonable amount of time, and so they'll they'll look at those opportunities where there's near term activity that's likely. Yeah, is is there a way for like end investors to kind of identify? You know, with transactions, it's not, it doesn't sound like there's a database that kind of centralizes and makes it all accessible. Is there a way, like, if you got an offer to just Google or, or maybe even Google search to see, hey, is there any permitting activity that I need to be aware of that might have, you know, changed the potential landscape of these minerals over the you know the next decade or so? Yeah, certainly. If you're an existing mineral owner or you're an investor, you'd look at the State Oil and Gas Commission website or in Texas, the Texas Railroad Commission. That's where those uh, permits will show up. And so all these investors are doing is pulling this publicly informa- publicly available information uh, and, and making these investment decisions and figuring out where they're going to focus on next. And so you know, to the extent they don't know the drill schedule or have, you know, deep insight into where a specific operator is going to go next, they'll look at those well permits. And again, that's all publicly available information. So if you do own minerals and royalties, that's one of the biggest pieces of advice that I give people. And and really it starts with understanding what you own and knowing where those assets are. And then once you know that, you can then keep tabs on, you know, when permits are filed or when there's drilling activity nearby. And then you can really be on the uh, proactive side of things and, and anticipate when you're going to get those offer letters because you'll know, oh yeah, the operator has just permitted wells that I'm going to have an interest in. And so I'm not surprised by this offer. It makes makes perfect sense that somebody's contacting me at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, financial planning is the same way, right? You got to organize before you optimize. And there's so many times we'll have like an incomplete balance sheet or assets that aren't considered that could, you know, or a pension they forgot about or some account that they're, you know, that they that they're not thinking about. So, you know, definitely it's, it's, you know, it's hard, but you got to take solid inventory before you optimize the asset, you know? So we talked about a little bit about valuation, but talk about kind of like understanding your asset. And I was talking with my business partner, Justin, about this. I feel like this has been a, this has been a really important thing that America has done, delineating the surface from the minerals and bifurcating that and allowing ownership of those things. Because from my understanding, that's a, you know, a minority of countries allow that, which has made, substi- you know, has created substantial economic opportunity to people across these basins. So it's real. I would say it's really rare and important that, you know, surface, you can own the surface, you can own the minerals, you can own both, you can bifurcate those, you can own an interest, you know, you can own a working or royalty interest in those minerals. So it's awesome because there's a lot of economic opportunity because of that, but it's also kind of created a lot of complexity, right? So so I'd love for you to just talk about the mechanics of that, right? So like, let's say you own, you know, what what is like a mineral interest versus a royalty interest? And then if you could just talk about, you know, I know you talk about this in depth on your podcast, but, um, you know, let's say you're in a position to negotiate a lease and a lease is, it doesn't already exist, right? Like there's working interests, there's non-participating royalty interests, there's a bunch of different ways you can change value, you know, structure the deal. I'd love for you to just talk about those at a high level. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's important to understand, uh, you know, because as your listeners will be familiar, the oil and gas uh, industry is very innovative and creative and these different types of partnerships exist and they can get very complicated. Uh, But just in general, you know, thinking about the different types of oil and gas interests, it's important to think about um, the mineral estate and then, you know, the leasehold interest. And so, um, you know, taking the surface aside, but just the ability for private mineral ownership, like you mentioned, is very unique to the United States and then a certain part of Canada and the rest of the world. That's not the case. The government owns the minerals. And so it's a, it's, it's provided a, a tremendous amount of economic ap- opportunity. And I think to a certain extent is one of the main reasons that we've experienced the um, the shale revolution here in the U S and it's that it, private ownership and the, um, you know, the ability to benefit from investment and applying technology to extracting these previously, uh, uneconomic, um, resources. And so the thing that I think is important to think about when you think about the mineral state, um, when you say royalty interest, that can be 
something that either is part of the mineral estate or part of the leasehold interest, or in other words, the working interest. And within the minerals, if you have producing mineral rights, you'll be receiving a royalty. And so that is called a royalty interest. Um, similarly, though, if you have an overriding royalty interest, which comes out of the oil and gas lease, that's another type of royalty interest. So it just depends on which uh, side of the coin that you're talking about. Uh, and then you mentioned non-participating royalty interest. That's another part that comes out of the mineral estate. And that's something where a mineral interest owner retains what's called the executive right, or in other words, the right to sign an oil and gas lease. But then they may grant uh, some or all of uh, their ability to receive royalty income. And so, you know, one use case for this, for example, is maybe you have um, somebody that has some grandkids that are minors. And so they want to hand these assets down to them, but they're not in a position, you know, they're not old enough to understand what an oil and gas lease is in order to negotiate it. And so they may retain the executive rights and may grant the grandkids a non-participating royalty interest. And so that if they uh, sign a lease in the future, well, starts producing, they'll re those grandkids will receive royalty interest. And so uh, there's lots of different ways these things can be carved up. They can be, you said, bifurcated or, you know, um, fractionated over time as they're um, split up and handed down to different generations. And that's something that's important, I think, to think about um, if you own these types of assets and you're looking to hand these down to the next generation is how do you keep them as whole as possible? Because at some point, you know, they'll become so small that uh, the value is minimized because a potential buyer is going to have the same amount of effort to manage, uh, you know, one one sixtieth uh, mineral interest as they would, you know, one tenth uh, mineral interest in, you know, say a quarter section of land. So it's something that is important to think about, you know, how do you, um, you know, both from a tax planning and financial planning standpoint, uh, point of view, but then also how do you maximize the value of these things, thinking multiple generations ahead and, and what is this going to look like, you know, uh, with my great grandkids, what are they going to be inheriting potentially? Uh, and how do I maximize the value for that, for the family? So. Yeah. And right. That you want to, you want to decentralize ownership from like a legacy asset gifting perspective, but you don't want to necessarily decentralize decision-making IE, you know, being able to come to the table and negotiate any lease or make any decisions regarding the asset, it'd be, you know, there's 30 different stakeholders. If, if you don't, if you don't manage it appropriately, where you know making any meaningful decision or progress is becomes difficult because how many parties are involved in the lack of the experience or continuity or vision. So you know, it's one of those things where you know a lot of our listeners probably have an asset, don't have really any understanding or really know how they would even go about unwinding or making any meaningful change because of how convoluted the process is. Yeah, definitely. And so, Matt, there's a, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can structure the deal. There's a lot of, you know, complexity. There's pros and cons you're trying to manage. You're trying to, you know, tax considerations, legacy considerations. I would say simplicity considerations, i.e., you know, how do we how do we do this with the least amount of brain damage possible, right? Does each, you know, does each well need its own LLC? Probably not. Do I need, you know, is there a way I can go from 100 K1s to 10? Probably, right? So, so many different considerations. So, you know, for our listeners, right, they're probably not going to know this is a good high level. Of, hey, here's kind of the considerations and nuances, but like financial planning, and there's so many, so many similarities. Like, how would you think about constructing a good team, right? So like in our case, like when we do comprehensive financial planning, you know, we're working with the estate planning attorneys, we're working with the accountants to kind of do tax projections. And, you know, the role we serve is kind of strategic high level, similar to what you do, uh, where it's like, hey, making sure almost quarterbacking, making sure every, everything is working in concert with one another, because people can kind of tend to be silos, but something like minerals, you know, have a lot of complexity across legacy, across taxes, across income, right? All of those things. So how do you think about constructing a good I would say mineral rights team. Who, who's typically on the team, and, and how are they? How are they working with the family? Yeah, and a lot of those same players that you just mentioned would be on that team. You know, the, if you think about the dream team, you're going to make up for minerals and royalties. You'd want to have your CPA involved because there's certainly uh, tax implications for decisions you make around these types of assets. Um, your attorney, for sure. You know, same. Uh, you know, on the estate planning side, thinking about to my earlier point, how do I um, plan on handing these down to my heirs to minimize 
the uh, brain damage and the learning curve. Uh, you know, perhaps you've gone through and had to figure this out yourself. You know, how do you minimize the pain? And, you know, certainly there are ways to do it where you're minimizing the expense and cost of passing these down, whether it's um, through a trust or through a family LLC or something like that. Um, and so those are things that you should be talking with your attorney and your CPA about in terms of what the best situation is for you. Um, and then, you know, certainly if you're looking at ever selling these types of assets or when these, uh, you know, perhaps you've just recently inherited these types of assets, it might be a time to think about getting a valuation to establish a step up in cost basis should you decide to sell in the future. Uh, if that's something that you're, you've talked with your financial planner and, and financial advisors and, and CPA, and that, that is, uh, you know, on the plans per, perhaps to sell these types of assets, it's wanting to minimize that capital gains tax liability. Because when you inherit these at the time of death, you establish, you can establish a step up in cost basis. So it's not worth zero when you go to sell it, it's worth whatever the value was on the, uh, on the date of death or the time that you inherited them. And so, that's something important to think about because, you know, as these assets, certainly with the shale revolution, some of these assets have appreciated uh, significantly. And so it can make a big difference in terms of how much you actually keep at the end of the day. Um, And then, you know, again, depending on what your ultimate goal is with this, if you're going to hold these for the long term, um, you know, you have to make the decision, is this something that I want to learn about and take an active role in managing, or do I want to outsource that as well? And so that could be something where you'd hire a, a mineral manager as part of the team. And when I say mineral manager, um, it's more again to the the more day to day management of the uh, the income that's coming in, distributing to the uh, the owners, to the the trustees, et cetera. And then also doing things like reviewing division orders, signing oil and gas leases, and all of those comes with a cost. So there's a cost to deciding to outsource that. And that's, a you know, depending on how much you're receiving in royalty income can be uh, a way to make sure that you're staying on top of that asset, but then also you, maybe you don't have time or don't have the interest in learning about the nuance of all the, you know, details of what do I need to think about when I'm negotiating a lease or uh, and, and then you can also go in between rather than outsourcing all of that, you can bring in your advisors, you know, sort of strategically as there are opportun- opportunities to do so. So, for example, if you're approached to sign an oil and gas lease, that's where you call your attorney to help you uh, review the lease terms to negotiate the best um, situation there uh, and those types of things. So it's it's sort of, um, I would say those those are the areas you'd want to look at. And then, you know, again, if you it all starts with really understanding exactly what you own. If you have inherited these from a relative and you didn't have a clear picture, it was not something that was, uh, you know, sort of documented very well and you had to go figure this stuff out. There's a chance that there's other assets out there that you don't even know about. And so that might be where you would bring in a landman to help you run title in the, uh, in the counties or the areas where, your relative lived or you know was in investing or maybe they worked in the oil and gas industry and received a bunch of overrides and working interests and minerals and you want to understand you know where all those things are located and figure out you know should you be getting paid on other mineral interests that maybe you just it's fallen through the cracks and you need to go out and claim and so that's you know again the other part that really starts at the beginning i would say is if you don't have a good uh, feel for what you own is potentially hiring a landman to help you run title and to track some of those assets down. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know ultimately it, it's sort of the landman. It's having your CPA, your attorney, uh, potentially an engineer, an appraiser to help you with the valuation stuff. And then depending on your situation, again, if you're going to take an active role versus outsourcing, you know that a mineral manager might fit in the picture as well. Yeah. And it sounds like there's like a spectrum, right? Because like we'll come across investors that are really, you know, almost do it yourselfers. And, you know, we think in most scenarios, you're better off with a team, right? That does this for a living. Could you learn enough to be dangerous? Potentially. Um, but I guess two, I guess two good questions to ask were, okay, do I have a good understanding of this? Or I guess three questions to ask, do I have a good understanding of this? How much work and energy is it to get a good understanding of this? And then what's the cost of missing something, right? Because I, I, when we work with clients, one of the things we do is we help them answer questions. But because we live in this, we also help help ask, help ask questions that they might not even be thinking about, right? So you really can't discount having somebody in your corner that eats, sleeps, and you know, kind of breathes 
this, right? Because they, they won't just answer your questions. They'll help you really take a holistic look and make sure they're considering everything you need to. Because you know, a lot of our listeners probably inherited royalty interest, but they don't have a good understanding, or they have an interest in investing in the asset class, but don't even know uh, they don't even know where to begin. But I want to I want to pivot a little bit. You talked about some really important capital gains, right? And so you know, there's potential step up in cost basis uh, at the time of death, like like with other financial assets, which is great. And it's even more important when you consider depletion, right, as a potential mechanism to lower cost basis on the, you know, along the way. Uh, it changes income. It changes, right, there, there's a cost basis on this app's asset. There's, I know that recapture is something that could potentially come into play as well. Um, and there's kind of like you said, there's a lot of different ways you can set up the ownership structure. Uh, and then there's, you know, corresponding income and estate tax implications. Um, I would love for you, you know, we're not going to cover all of those things, but I would love for you to just talk about, you know, let's take a step back now that we kind of know strategically, okay, how do we think about minerals? Are there any things at a high level where you say, Hey, you know, if you're going to minerals and financial planning, I would, you know, generally I would avoid this type of structure. I would of course make sure you have a team. Are there any kind of rules of thumb or common mistakes that you see people make uh, when you begin working with them? Yeah, I think the, one of the biggest mistakes is just, again, I think I, I'm kind of harping on it, but like going back to understanding what you own. So I think that's really a fundamental thing that people need to understand uh, in order to make sense of what, what exactly they own, what the options are. Um, but you know that aside, I would say it's it's again maybe not consulting those uh, advisors when they're looking to make a decision. You know, a lot of my clients fortunately are are proactive and they said, hey, you know, I think I need to get help, and so they are the ones that are reaching out before an important decision has been made, and so I can loop in, you know, their attorney or loop in their CPA and and help them um, make the sense of you know what are the different options that they have. Um, you know, I think. You know, again, thinking about this long term is probably one of the biggest mistakes. And people think of the near term in, in terms of whether it's, oh, this this company is offering me a very high lease bonus. I'm going to just sign the first oil and gas lease that I get, not going and negotiating a higher royalty rate because that'll have a direct impact on the future value of that asset. Uh, or, you know, again, to your point you know, earlier, they received an unsolicited purchase offer in the mail and they just go ahead and sign it and then they are leaving a lot of money on the table. And so I think that's, it's, it's taking a step back, getting with your advisors. And then, you know, with minerals and royalties, there are a lot of potential tax implications. You mentioned the depletion deduction, which is something that all royalty owners can take advantage of. And that's the ability, it's, it's sort of the equivalent of um, depreciating capital assets. So it's the ability to, um, the most common is the percent depletion where you take 15% as a, as a, uh, tax deduction off of the gross royalty income for the year. And so um, that's something that's a benefit from a, a royalty standpoint. And then if you have, uh, you know, the ability to um, invest in working interest, there's also some significant tax benefits from that as well. But that's probably a more uh, detailed and complex, uh, you know, conversation we could have down the road if that's something that your listeners are interested in. But, you know, I think, again, back to the the mistakes, it's really not getting help. I think I, you could generalize it when you um, are presented with a important decision. And I think there's a lot to think about. And, and even, you know, for those of us that have worked in the oil and gas industry our entire careers, minerals and royalties is a little bit nuanced. You know, it took me several years before I really was able to wrap my um, head around some of those nuances and the thing. And, and I'm learning stuff every day, you know, even in my um, business now, because, they're, each state is different. Each um, type of asset is different. And so there's a lot to learn. And so don't feel bad, even if you are an experienced professional in, in, uh, in the oil and gas industry, you know, you, you bring a lot to the table in, in terms of understanding this asset class. But I would say just, you know, biggest piece of advice is don't be afraid to get help on some of the more detailed, nuanced stuff. You know, I'm not a landman, so I'll, I'll call my um, land professional friends and, and landmen and to get help on some title issues or something that is unique that we run into. And so, um, you know, I think that's important to think about. Yeah. I, I think you touched on something really important, which is, you know, localized expertise because legislation varies, you know, it's kind of like estate planning. You set up a trust or a will in one state and, you know, the rules that aren't necessarily applicable are the same in different states, right? I remember hearing on one of your podcasts that I think, I think you said Colorado is one of the states where 
royalty income from an outside state uh, could potentially be subject to Colorado state income taxes. And so there's just a million little things like that where it's easy to, you know, kind of forget or, or probably not even forget, but just not be aware of because you're not in the weeds and the nuance of this every day. Yeah, exactly. And so Matt, I, I feel like a good place to kind of wrap up this conversation. I feel like each of the topics could have been their own episode. So I'll, I hope we hear from listeners a lot of where we want to go deeper because we'll probably have to have you back on. Um, but so we probably have people that want to invest in this asset class, right? Like a, like a good investment adage is buy what you know, right? And uh, you know, a lot of for a lot of people, and especially listening to this podcast, it's it's oil and gas uh, or it's minerals. Um, and so there's probably a, there's probably you know a lot of listeners with an appetite for investing uh, in the asset class. And so I, I guess a few questions for you: like, where should someone go if they're interested uh, in learning about you know, or, or or maybe investing? And then okay. Okay, once I learn, what are the different types of ways I can invest, right? Because it is convoluted of, you know, if, if I don't own it, minerals, how, how do I invest in the asset class? Or I'm not in the spot to negotiate a lease. I'd love for your feedback for, you know, for any of our listeners that, that do, you know, that may have some interest in that. Yeah, and I, it's definitely something where, um, you know, it's a great opportunity for people that work or have worked in the oil and gas industry because you have a tremendous amount of exist, you know, knowledge that you've built up over the years, you can leverage that and you know how you know, the process to drill a well and you know how long it takes, you know, to go through the permitting process and to drill and complete and then, you know, flow back and put it on production. And so you have all of that kind of industry knowledge, which is a huge uh, strategic advantage. And then it's just learning about the specifics with this asset class. I think that, you know, the thing that I really like about minerals and royalties, it's an opportunity to invest directly in uh, in this uh, you know the future outcome of whatever oil and gas prices are potentially going to do without having to go and buy futures contracts or be you know very um, exposed on that side in, in terms of um, if something goes wrong you know so I think that it's a great way to get that direct exposure to oil and gas price movement and you know leveraging your existing knowledge and, and saying I, I think gas prices for example right now maybe are going to go up a couple years from now because of the LNG export capacity that's going to come online. And, you know, maybe you worked in the Haynesville and you have a deep knowledge of that asset. Well, in that example, you know, leverage what you know. If you know something from work, you know, you've just recently retired, you've worked in the Permian, you've worked in the Haynesville, whatever um, basin it is, you already know a lot about that that gives you a leg up on other investors. And so leverage that knowledge. I would start with what you know. And, and again, that's you know, probably geographically with an area that you're familiar with, you know, the regulations, you know, the, you know, the technology, the completions, you know, uh, methodologies and, you know, the, the things that they're doing in the field. And so I think that's a great way to get started. And then it's just a matter of learning the specifics around, um, you know, minerals and royalties themselves. And one way to educate yourself and at least just get a feel for what the market is like, not necessarily market price, but the different assets that are, available for sale, you know, whether you're looking at a wellbore only interest, a non-participating royalty interest, a working interest, other, you know, non-producing minerals on energynet.com is a great place. You can go create an account and see what assets are out there on the auction price. Now, I will say, uh, um, before you go and, and um, start investing, one disclaimer is to be careful, make sure you know what you're doing, because I do see a lot of deals going for a lot more than their um, worth when you do a discounted cash flow analysis, uh, you know, when you look at how much they'd actually ever make back on, in royalties. And so, but I think just in general, being able to see what are, you know, what are the different types of assets, where are they located? You know, what are the hot areas? What are areas that are maybe not as competitive? Um, and then again, leverage, you know, publicly av available information. Once you've sort of picked an area to focus on initially, if you're looking to invest, go and research the wells that are being permitted, go research the production, you know, start to build type curves. If you're a former reservoir engineer, start running some economics on these assets to see, you know, what, what is one net mineral acre worth at different discount rates and different outcomes. And then, you know, again, I, I would say if you are looking at pulling the trigger and investing directly, um, then it's to start small and to get help. We mentioned those different types of advisors that can help guide you through your first few investments. I would say that's helpful 
because there can be a steep learning curve. And especially when it comes to things like running title and, and navigating um, title defects, because I will say that I'd say it's more common than not, especially if you're going out off market and identifying mineral owners and contacting them directly, that you'll run into an issue where somebody um, doesn't have marketable title. You have to go through a determination of airship or they'll have to open up ancillary probate in the in the county where the minerals are located and get that all cleared up before you, you have clear title. So that is um, th- things you can get help with from a landman and an attorney. But, you know, I think, again, if, if this is an asset class you're interested in, you know, think about your risk tolerance. Think about, you know, talking with Jared and and, and their team, you know, they'll help you with, with that. And then because um, there's different ways to invest, you can do it like I've been alluding to. You can go out, contact mineral owners directly and um, buy things directly, buy minerals and royalties and or working interests. Um, but there's other ways too. You can uh, maybe not have as much of a hands-on approach, but still get direct um, exposure to these assets through other direct participation plans like a mineral fund. Um, most of those are structured as a limited partnership. And so you'd have a general partner that you'd be trusting to make those investment decisions. They'll get a management fee along with maybe a carried interest in terms of if that fund meets the target uh, return uh, for the LPs. And so you'll, you'll, they'll, they'll take a portion of that and you have, that's something to think about in the overall return. But again, you could hire somebody or you could um, partner with somebody that has a deep experience in the industry that has a proven track record. And that could be a way to go and not have um, the, to deal with the day-to-day stuff and all the decisions and learning this. So it just depends on your um, particular goals and what uh, your risk tolerance is. But there's lots of different options. Again, if you're going, doing the DIY route, that's something that I help um, coach uh, individual investors and in looking at, you know, trying to navigate this and understand the steps and kind of holding them, their hand through that process. And so that's something that can definitely be done. And, and especially if you have um, background in uh, oil and gas industry, you have a leg up, I think, on a lot of other investors. Yeah, Matt, I think that's spot on, right? I think one of the things it's talked about is like a range of outcomes is kind of what you mentioned. There's DIY, there's a mineral fund, um, and kind of direct investments. Come on, like owning futures, kind of like for reasons you alluded to, it's kind of not the most efficient way to own it, especially because you have to roll futures contracts and, you know, those become prohibitively expensive, you know, when there's a lot of volatility. But, but you know, kind of the, the question is, you know, how, how comfortable are you with a wider range of outcomes? I think with DIY, there's higher upside and downside, right? With minerals, you know, they, because they take a percentage of, you know, additional profit above and beyond a target threshold, you know, there's kind of a return cap, but maybe... Right, you're not you're not leaning on your own due diligence. You're leaning on the due diligence professionals. So that's that's kind of a great call out. Um, Matt, more of a financial planning question for you. How do you think about right? So kind of so there's these competing ideas. There's buy what you know, but then also if you only buy what you know, you end up with a portfolio that's probably way too concentrated in one sector. Right. So how do you uh, you know when, when we think about investing in the stock market, we want to diversify across company size, so big companies, small companies, geography, not just U.S. style, so some value, some growth, right? So really, kind of building a diversified thing. So you know, how do you think about okay, hey, I want to buy what I know and really kind of take advantage of where I have target expertise, but also I don't want to bet the farm on one you know basin or maybe one project even, and some you know legislative risk comes in, tail risk comes in and just kind of blows up my plans. So I'd love to hear how you kind of think about it in your own portfolio and also how you kind of guide people in managing the, you know, buy what you know, but also, you know, risk manage it and be diversified as well. Yeah. I think, you know, if you're in this longer term, then you can look at uh, more geographic diversification. So to your point, if there's maybe some uh, regulations that are passed in one state that could hamstring, you know, future oil and gas development, then it could be something where being spread out over multiple states or multiple basins can help. And then also, you know, mixing between oil and gas. And so, you know, right now we're in a position where gas prices are down, whereas oil has actually been, um, you know, pretty stable. We're, you know, sitting around $80 a barrel, whereas gas is sitting around $2.50. So it's something where you could look at, you know, balancing that uh, product mix, I guess, in terms of the different um, assets that you own. And, you know, so I think that that's, you know, definitely something to think about if you're looking at diversifying, you know, within this asset class. And of course, again, you know, thinking about how much you're investing 
in this versus your overall net worth and, you know, not putting all your eggs in one basket sort of a thing. And I know that one of the pieces of advice that I would get from working in the oil and gas industry is, you know, your job is already potentially um, giving you a good exposure to oil and gas. And so then, you know, thinking about this as, you know, supplement to that, or maybe after you've retired, you have a ton of assets, you know, they're in the stock market and you're not feeling so great about where the economy might be headed. Well, oil and gas is, you know, for me personally, that's the, the types of things that I think about with my portfolio, having um, been in the position that your listeners are in, having worked for a super major and, and having direct exposure to oil and gas through my previous uh, role, you know, working in that side of things. And then and now in the consulting and, um, and, and, you know, the minerals and royalty side. So I think that's, of course, just a decision it's unique to each person, you know, get help with your, you know, from, from Jared and your team, you know, I'm sure that you guys can help your listeners to, to navigate that. But I think, you know, again, thinking about, um, you know, oil and gas assets are, are great in terms of, you know, especially thinking about where we are with inflation. I think I'm, I'm really, I've liked where my oil and gas assets have been performing relative to maybe some of the other uh, assets that I own. So I think that's, um, all part of the consideration, you know, to think about in, in investing in minerals and royalties. So, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I'm totally, you know, there's been a systematic underinvestment in the oil and gas for the past, you know, 10 to 20 years and demand is kind of, you know, it, it's way more, it's way more inelastic than people think. Uh, and I'm a big advocate for, you know, the energy transformation, but I would say sentiment precedes infrastructure, right? And, you know, there's a lot of limiting things with, you know, some of the alternative energy sources that, you know, are things that we're going to have to work through. So it kind of makes for a a systematic, uh, an opportunity to kind of systematically invest uh, in the asset class. Matt, I appreciate it so much. Uh, I would love to kind of, as like a a parting thing, uh, where can listeners find you, you know, if you want to talk about the podcast, if you want to talk about NARO, uh, Silver Heels, floor is yours. How can people kind of stay in touch and reach out if they have questions? Well, probably the best way is through the podcast, and that can be found at mineralrightspodcast.com or just on any of your favorite podcast players. We publish content weekly and we'll um, you know, keep people in, updated on you know, the things that we talked about today, all the nuances around uh, owning these types of assets or investing in these types of assets. Uh, if you want to send me an email, you can do that at feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, and, you know, if you're a mineral and royalty owner, I uh, strongly encourage you to become a member of NARO. Um, you can find out more at naro-us.org. Uh, we actually have our national convention coming up in October in New Orleans, which is a great place to learn from industry experts about all the types of things that we talked about today, the nuances around owning and managing these types of assets. So if you do own minerals and royalties or wanting to learn more about making uh, sure that you're being proactive and, and especially if you're thinking about handing these assets down to the next generation, uh, you know, it's an important time, I think, to get educated, and understand what the options are to make sure that you're making the right decisions. Um, so that's a great organization. We have in-person events and various state chapters, as well as webinars and and virtual events and stuff like that. So great uh, asset for uh, mineral and royalty owners. And then um, through the Mineral Rights Podcast, I'm going to be publishing an online course here this fall to help uh, mineral and royalty owners and also beginning investors understand the asset class uh, a little more deeply around the different types of assets, how to run title how to figure out where there's oil and gas activity so you can start to be proactive in managing these types of assets. So, um, so yeah, you can find out more at the, at the website, mineralrightspodcast.com. Awesome. And we will link to as much of that in the show notes as possible. But Matt, thank you so much for your time. And listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, like, subscribe, share. We'd also love to hear questions from you. What, what about mineral rights did we not cover? What questions do you still have? Uh, We'd love to hear from you about this episode or future ideas for future episodes. Podcast at brownleewealthmanagement.com. Thanks. We'll see you next time.